Thank you for joining us on this journey to discover more about the English Riviera UNESCO Global Geopark, one of Earth's extraordinary places. In this series of interviews, our patron, Professor Ian Stewart, explores what it is that makes this geopark so special, from when the rocks around us were formed, to evidence of early humans, and right up to artists and writers who are being inspired by the geopark today. So welcome everyone to uh, the latest discussion around the English uh, Riviera Global, uh, UNESCO Global Geopark and in particular what we're talking about today is, is caves because this particular part of the country has got uh, it's quite a number of, of caves, it's one of the characteristics of this fantastic kind of limestone scenery that we have around here and some of them are absolutely world famous, world leading and that's really what we're going to be delving into today, delving into the the, uh, the troglodytic darkness, really. We've got three people uh, with us. We've, I'll get them to introduce themselves in a second and talk a little bit about their background. But we've got Tara Beakeroff, we've got uh, Donna McFarlane, and we've got uh, Nick Powell. And so all, all three have got different perspectives um, into this topic of, of the caves, really, of this area, and of caves in general, really. But Tara, tell us a little bit about yourself. How come you like caves? <laughs> um, so... So my background is um, I've worked at Kent Cavern, but I'm also um, a caver um, for Devon and Cornwall, and I'm a conservation officer for Devon and Cornwall Underground Council. So I think my experience is probably very hands-on um, in terms of getting out and about and exploring places. I've travelled and done expeditions in France and spent lots of time in exploring countless hours and caves for the last eight years all over the UK. I love that idea of the underground council. Does that actually exist as an underground council? Yeah, so, um, so all caves are represented in the UK by the British Caving Association um, and each county tends to have its own council which um, nice. will kind of liaise with access agreements, um, how to cave safely, conservation and how we can kind of look after these sites but make it safe you know it's, it is an extreme sport um, so the councils are there to kind of um, liaise with the local community of cavers. I, I had a vision of Devon and Cornwall Council actually meeting downstairs in the caves that's what I was going to. Uh, Donald again you're, what's your, uh, your perspective onto this today? Well, I started caving in England uh, as a teenager in the Mendips and um, then uh, Liverpool University up at, uh, in the Dales. And then I was in uh, Northern Ireland for a while, uh, caving in what became Marble Arch uh, Geoparks some years later. And then I ended up doing a, a PhD in the United States and um, primarily worked for a number of years on extinct mammals in caves in, in the West Indies. And then, uh, but <clears throat> I'm I've done a number of research projects around the world in Asia and, and uh, Africa and so on, but um, being interested in extinct mammals, posits, paleoclimate issues in caves, having that English background, um, mm. began a decade or more ago now, probably 15 years ago now, working in, <clears throat> in uh, some of the caves in Britain that were primarily excavated in the 19th century and were in some cases in need of, of some revision in terms of putting modern dates and, and so on, reinterpretations. And uh, it's hard to work on bone caves in Britain without eventually, uh, sooner or later, coming to, to Kent's cavern because it is such a unique site. And that, that kind of uh, speleology in terms of the academic contribution has really kind of come on in leaps and bounds over the, la the last few years, in particular around the paleoclimate, but also kind of paleoanthropology as well and we'll definitely we'll come, come back to that but before we do we should introduce our last guest Nick Powell and particularly in your relationship to a cave that I think will dominate today's discussion which is Kent's Cavern. Nick tell us about your contribution. Well uh, yes yeah, so, well I'm, I'm, I'm not a caver <laughs> I'm not a geologist <laughs> and, and I'm not an archaeologist um, but uh, I happen to run Kent's Cavern and uh, and I've been doing so for the last 20 years. It was um, um, but it's, it's been in my family for five generations. And my great, great grandfather um, was involved in the original excavations, the Victorian excavations that took place between 1865 and 1880. 
and uh, they finished actually on the 19th of June, so um, 140 hmm. years ago. And, um, and at that point, George, George Smurden became um, custodian of the cave and guide and uh, started showing people around the caves. And uh, so it became a show cave. And uh, through five generations of my family, we've been running it as a show cave, trying to um, obviously look after it, but and also to get people to come into the environment in a safe way. And, um, and yeah, so that's um, that's what I do. And, and Kent's Cavern is the showcase cave in in this kind of region, isn't it? It's the it's the one that the ordinary punters will will go to to get that that experience. And I've I've, I've done it myself. And uh, but it is. I'd like to explore this kind of almost this culture of caves amongst because you're coming at it from such different angles before we get onto this kind of scientific detail of, of what we find at, at places like Ken's Cavern. But what is it about caves? It, that, it seems to be it's that, you know, that introduction to that alien underworld a little bit that people can quite happily pass most of their life, daily lives without thinking about. It. And then suddenly they go into a cave and they're faced with this very different kind of world from the one that they normally think about. Is that, anyone want to pick up on that about what it is it caves it does it for them or or how they relate to the public? Well I think what's interesting is for, for many people that visit Ken's Cavern it's, it's, it's actually their first time into a cave. Um, uh, many people because we're, we're, we're located in Torquay, like the seaside resort, um, it's kind of the last thing you expect to find in in Torquay <laughs> is a cave and um, and everybody's here to sit on the beach, really. And uh, uh, but when the weather turns turns a bit uh, a bit unsettled, um, they suddenly decide, well, what are we going to do today? Oh, there's a cave. Let's go and visit a cave. So so you get people coming here, and they've never really felt that experience of stepping into the cave. And it's this wonderful sense of going into an area that's well, something that suddenly feels quite different to anything else that you experience, because you're stepping mm. in the summer. You're stepping into a, a, a cave that's 15 degrees, so it feels quite chilly. But then everything's really quiet and quite often on a busy day here um it's it, there's a whole buzz of people outside and you as soon as you step in the cave there's 40 40 of you with your guide and suddenly it just goes completely quiet and it's like an extraordinary transition into this mm. wonderful environment and then as you wander around the cave of course there's no wind there's just this funny well, there's nice smell of the cave it's a very distinctive smell um, as you go around and it's got it just feels different and i think that's that's what people are in, interested by and there's that lovely moment when you turn the lights off and almost invariably someone says oh it's dark <laughs> and that total blackness that actually people realize actually we are very rarely experienced total blackness it's actually um it's, it's, it's what everybody remembers they always the first thing they ask me is why is it called kent's cavern that's the first question mm -hmm. goes, why is it called kent's cavern we yeah. should deal with that one <laughs> well, why kent's cavern well, it used to be Kent's apostrophe cavern, so Kent's, you know, yeah. uh, with apostrophe s, and uh, and it's probably all to do with an old, an, a word, an old English word for water going back in time, and before it was Kent's okay. cavern, Kent's hole, Kent's pops, so it's probably something to do with that, um, but it's, there was never a Mr. Kent, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the county of Kent, of course, we're here in Devon, um, so it's, it's probably an old English word, but I wonder if it was, you know, has been... In manuscript, it's the, the apostrophe has been, you know, maybe it was an I before, so Kentis, Kentis. But you get a lot of Kent's Bank, you know, it's quite, it's quite a common name for association with water and headlands. So um, that's probably where it comes from. So that's one of the things they pick up. And then the other one? The other one is, do, do you still turn the question, do you, do, you, do you still turn the lights off? That's the, the second most popular question we get. You know? Yeah, yeah, we still turn the lights off. And uh, we do it a bit differently now. It's, um, it's quite nice. We snuff out a, um, a candle and... Uh, uh, or it's like a, a oh, shell. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a scallop shell that was used originally to, to light the caves by the people that lived here in Paleolithic times. And uh, so that's um, so that's what we do. We snuff that out and then it goes dark. And it's, um, so, I mean, I'll ask Donald this in a second, but Tara, is it, I mean, you must be fascinated by that. I mean, you're very familiar now with that alien, for, what, for the rest of us in alien world. Tell us about your relationship with it. I think for me, I think I probably take it to a more of extreme version of what the general public experience and I think Don will probably agree with me that we're quite a rare breed of cavers who want to go and abseil 200 meters down a uh, waterfall just to get to these places but I think it's one of those things where you're, you're, you're so remote in some of these places that there has literally been a few hundred people in this place and I think how, where can else on earth really can you get to those kind of um sites and i think it's 
it's a bug that really hits you um, because you're so immersed in this environment. You're so focused mm. on the roar of the streamway, the, you know, just the beam of your light, you know, the shouts of your fellow cavers as you're moving along. And it just, it, there's no real environment now that it just takes you away from, from the current world. You know, you're stripped away of all your technology, your phone's gone, you're looking at a paper map trying to navigate your way through. And I think that's why for me it's so special because it's such a rare um, place to be in. Because, I mean, literally for most people, although there are these different alien environments of the atmosphere and the deep ocean and um, even, I guess, mountains, th this is really one that very rarely do people ever encounter themselves. And people, I, I've got quite an anxiety. I mean, if you think from co contemporary, or not even contemporary culture, just culture, the, under, the underworld is not generally a good yeah. place. It's where things come out to get you and bring you down and horrible things come out. Um, and yet this is an environment that you've, you've kind of made your own, uh, Tara. I mean, is that, do people kind of look at you weirdly when you say you do all this stuff? Yeah, I think probably because I don't look like a caver either, I think. <laughs> um, or a stereotypical caver, I guess, if that's what's in people's minds. The first thing people always say to me, as soon as you say to anyone, I do caving or I go on the ground is the automatic response is I hate small spaces. Oh, yeah. okay. Get it back straight away. And it always makes me laugh because some of the caves I've been in, you have to use a compass to navigate through a chamber because it's so big. You can't yeah. see the walls. So actually the small spaces are pretty uh, tiny and, and few between. And, and most likely if you're going for a really horrible crawl, it's because you're going to find something quite special on the other side. Um, mm. But it takes a lot of mental determination, I think, as well. And I think people don't push themselves sometimes. I think that um, people look at me and kind of go, why would you want to do that? <laughs> How long have you got? So, to do do, yeah, exactly. Donald, why do you want to do that then? What, what was it for you? Oh, I, I would just, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with, with uh, Tara there, but I, I would also add that even in, in, in Britain, even, uh, even in Britain, on an average year, there are probably a couple of hundred meters of new cave being discovered every year. Mm. No one has ever been into. Um, th th there's just no other environment uh, where average people can involve themselves in that kind of original exploration, you know, even on a global scale. So it, it, it's very, it's a very yeah. seductive. Uh, it, it always slightly confuses me when we have this fixation with space and you know so there was a couple of weeks ago the rocket you know went up and these we're sending people to the space station and these probes that go out and deeper and uh, and yeah it's all empty up there and we'll never ever get there i mean actually whereas down beneath our feet there is this fascinating world that is very close it is accessible as people find it and it's got this incredible wealth of information about our our past but also sometimes resources and things like that and it's always it's strange why it gets a you know a raw deal in, in some respects but but maybe you quite like it that way is it, is it kind of nice to have that it sounds like a self-help group for cavers and it's not meant to be but do you feel you're part of a kind of small cultish group that appeal you know, you know feel very familiar with caves i mean would you like it was suddenly the whole world wanted to go down them and start investigating or uh, I, a small cult. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think for me, the caving community is so special because it almost feels like, yes, the technology is involved in terms of lights and stuff, but it feels like the actual community itself hasn't been that much touched by time. So we yeah. have dotted around the UK little caving huts that you can go and stay in. You walk in there and it's just so friendly and there's no kind of technology. There's no, everyone's just you just sit down by a fire and talk about your passion. And I yeah. just think, yeah. whatever sport do you have that you can have that? So, um, yeah. so it's, it's really nice. Well, let's talk about the caves around uh, the Torbay area. Uh, we've, we've mentioned Kent's Cavern. Nick, I mean, uh, so Kent's Cavern isn't the only cave. And so do you want to talk us through in terms of the, the diversity of, of caves? It goes from tiny little inlets to, to you know, Kent's Cavern, I guess. Actually, uh, the, there are there are many caves in this area. It's a limestone area. It's, it's Devonian limestone, of course. It, 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 that's the rock here, and where you get limestone, you're going to get caves. And uh, 
um, and particularly the the type of limestone that we've got here. And um, so there's a there are very there are famous caves throughout the the geopark area. So over in Brixham, there's a there's a very famous cave. And in fact, the original excavations that took place in the cave it, here in Kent's Cavern were motivated by what was found over in over in Brixham. Because the problem with Kent's Cavern is that um, and this is probably the third most popular question, is when was Kent's Cavern discovered? <laughs> and, and, it, and it's never been discovered. It's been known about for, well, 2,000 years, really, um, in, in terms of modern history. So we know that Roman, there's Roman yeah. coins were found in the cave. So 2,000 years ago, people were here. There's evidence of, um, uh, of, uh, of evidence during the, during the Iron Age, the Bronze Age as well. So, so there's this fantastic sort of uh, connection with humans. And people have been coming in and out of the caves for, for, for centuries. And because of that, when the Victorians were, 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 were finding evidence of, of uh, extinct animals, but what they were finding alongside these extinct animals was evidence of humans. And, the, and it was about how they could prove that these, the, the evidence of humans had not just been placed in the cave in the last 2,000 years, um, but it, had been, it was generally much older than, than, than that. And this little cave in Brixham um, was, uh, it was about the 1858, 1859, when a builder was building a, a, for a, a row of cottages and was punching through the back um, to, to, to put the foundations in and punched into this completely sealed cave. And in this cave were mm. the same kind of artifacts that had been found in Kent's cavern. But nobody could use the argument to say, ah, those have been placed there by modern people because modern people didn't know about this cave. So, so yeah, there's this great story. So there are caves, and, the, and, and Tara, and I'm sure Don will know more about the other caves in the, in the area that I do, but, but that's the sort of the social side, the social history behind caves and what they meant, and the fact that people have been using them uh, to shelter mm. in is what's extraordinary. Well, we'll, we'll get on to the scientific aspects later. I mean, uh, Tara or Donald, in, in terms of those wider caves, and, it, what's, what, what should people, can, or could people look out for in terms of in the Torbay area? Um, I think it's generally categorised by three different types. So you have um, sea caves, um, which tend to be really diverse and lots of marine biology. So um, most of them are obviously accessible only by diving or at low tide. Um, then obviously you have like Kent's Cavern, the Phreatic Caves, um, the Solution Ones, and then you have sort of quite dangerous slip you, you, which are you said phreatic caves and solution ones. You better explain those terms, I think, to people. Oh, I think Don said <laughs> probably. Don't worry, Don, phreatic, fresh, fresh water. Yeah, about phreatic, please, Donald. When caves are initially forming, you can imagine a solid beds of limestone uh, sitting beneath, beneath the water table. So uh, when the, the cracks and fissures in that limestone are, are completely um, flooded with water below the water table, uh, we would then get sort of phreatic caves forming and then uh, later on uh, as the water table, as, as the landscape erodes down, water table descends, uh, the caves drain and we get a different set of features, um, sort of meadows features. So the, whether the, the passages are formed below the waterline or above the waterline um, affects the, the shape of the passages and, and, and just general structure. So you tend to get kind of above the waterline, if I remember my geography, the Vados one, you tend to get these very keyhole uh, case quite narrow and then below the waterline they, they broaden out because you're getting is that, right. is that, below, is that below still the, the way it's thought about right below the waterline we would expect the passage shapes to be oval or circular in nature as opposed to that keyhole shape that uh, you, you would find uh, above the water table and, and what's interesting about that, and maybe we'll come come back to this later but i guess that i it touches on this paleo climate how you, the morphology of the cave actually reflects the environment that it's found in, which might be very different. Well, it's usually very different to the environment that we now uh, find in. But, but sorry, Tara, I interrupted you. You were talking about some of the other uh, caves in the area. I think what's um, really important about and interesting about the caves in our area is they are really, really different to other areas. Like, for example, in Yorkshire, they've got these massive potholes in the middle of the day. As you go down there, there's a huge system. Whereas in uh, the English Riviera, it's, it's quite unique because much of the caving is so urban. Um, you have caves, a cave in Brixham, which is on a sort of a cliff face just underneath a block of flats. So it's quite different experience of caving going into these places 
outside someone's house where in lots of other counties in the UK it's very remote so I think that's kind of what's quite special um they tend to be quite challenging <laughs> at times um, challenging so, can you <laughs> explain what you mean by challenging then uh, a lot of the caves, you know, particularly like the ones I mentioned in Brixton, they tend to be, because the geology of the area is quite broken up, you don't have huge plateaus of limestone. So a lot of the passageways can get quite tight or the entrances, um, you know, you can be doing a handstand to get into a few of them or you can be on a quite a low, grovelly exploration crawl um, as opposed to some of the, the bigger systems. Um, around the UK. See, that's what would freak me out. It is, it is that classic narrow passage. You've said so, it. <laughs> but we, I have done it, yeah. And I, I'm not sure I still like But we probably should say at this point, this juncture, about the public accessing these places. Or presumably, be, the way you've described it, you wouldn't necessarily encourage Joe Public just to kind of squeeze into these kind of places, exploring on their own. No, definitely not. It's, uh, you know, we are you know relatively trained in what we do i'd say if you're interested in in caving then don't do it alone you know go and research your local caving club or um get you know an outdoor sports center to go and take you um and be safe wear the right equipment as a member of cave rescue i don't want to come and get you <laughs> so um so yeah always always cave safely you're not drumming up business for cave rescue here so. <laughs> yeah donald i mean in terms of your knowledge of this region i mean what are your the, what are the gems what are the standout places that you if you were here you, you know you would be delving into one of the differences uh, that we see with the, the the caves in devon is well, it just relates to the uh, last million years or so of, of earth history here in that you know, our largest caving area in in, in britain it is the yorkshire dales uh, but those areas were completely covered over by huge ice sheets during the various um, ice ages and ice advances. And that has the effect of, uh, in some cases, eroding away uh, shallow caves and some of the deposits and otherwise, but otherwise might be there. But in Devon, De Devon was never overridden by those ice sheets, just sufficiently far south. And so that creates a rather different sort of uh, long-term historical environment for those caves and I think better preservation of the shallow parts of the caves uh, where animal bones and things are more likely to, to accumulate. And so, um, mm. as a sort of proportion of the total number of caves in Devon, there are a relatively high number uh, that have historically yielded uh, really interesting um, archaeological and paleontological. So let's shift into that because, you know, I'm sure everyone listening or watching is very aware that in those, those earliest times, caves would have been, you know, the place to stay, to, to interrupt for, you know, starting that kind of human story, uh, really, and then its interaction with the world around and ind indeed culture as well. So they're, they're kind of a repository, an archive, really, of all of these, these our earliest stories. Um, Donald, could you take us a little bit about, um, well, maybe the excavation, you know, the, as, as Nick was saying, and there wasn't necessarily a discovery, but, but in terms of the earliest excavation, particularly the systematic way that people started to really look at these uh, caves in Kent's Cavern, I guess, is the classic one. Right. Well, the, the, the first excavations there were undertaken by Reverend uh, McHenry around about 1825 and, and kind of sporadically and so on. And then uh, Pengelly uh, got involved in a much more systematic way in 1865. I think what, one of the, the paradoxes here is that in the modern world, uh, as cavers, scientists, whatever, uh, we're very focused on cave conservation, preservation, and, and so on. So the idea is to do as little damage as possible in, in caves. The Victorians didn't have that same sensibility. And as a result, uh, when Pengelly began serious excavation in 1865, uh, he was using uh, large amounts of gunpowder. Probably over 15 years, he probably used more gunpowder than Guy Fawkes and uh, blasted out uh, huge areas of, of, of rock and so on in a way it would, would be totally unacceptable today. But the result of that is that we now have these amazing sections. We can see these sections that were cut down uh, and in an, in an unexcavated cave elsewhere, 
there might be deposits in there, but we just wouldn't know about it because of, of, of all the intact material. So it, it's that kind of uh, un, unusual situation where great damage in Victorian times actually has exposed and, and left in, in the modern day uh, these wonderful sections. So we can now look at the stratigraphy uh, and the history of the cave in a way that is difficult in almost any other case. What was the, the motivation then in the sense that, you know, they clearly weren't doing it gradually and doing it very, very carefully. So w why were they doing it in such a blunt way? What were they trying to get out? Well, they were particularly interested in the potential um, co-occurrence of human remains and the remains of extinct animals, which had uh, significance to the interpretation of, of the, the, the history of, of humans, uh, particularly in, in, in sort of traditional biblical context where uh, perhaps uh, in earlier centuries, the, the assumption was that these extinct animals would have been the victims of Noah's flood. Yeah. And then humans came along uh, long later. Finding these things together uh, meant that clearly that there was a, a, a much longer history of, of humans in the natural world. And in order to prove that, given that it was a fairly controversial idea when it was first proposed, it was necessary to show that you had unambiguous human remains or human tools, ideally uh, human bones, uh, alongside the bones of extinct mammoths and saber-toothed cats and so on, and then covered over uh, with a mm. thick layer of, um, of, 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 of flowstone or stalagmite that would have sealed that, that unit until it was broken through by the excavators. So, so I'm right in saying it was it was really Pengeli who brings that systematic approach that, that, that replaces that that previous kind of precisely uh, because in, in, in other excavations going on typically uh, the cave would just be cleaned out and there, there would be a, a large collection of bones but there would be no uh, documentation as to where a particular bone came from within the cave. And Pengeli invented a system whereby every every bone every artifact uh, was numbered and could be related back to a specific place in the cave. So even today, one can go to the museum, uh, one can look at a, one of Pengeli's bones, look at the, the field number on that bone, and we can go into Kent's cavern, with Nick's permission there, and uh, find out exactly, uh, both horizontally and vertically, where that bone was when it was found. And was that unique across the globe? I mean, is this the first place we see it happening, systematic, systematic cave archaeology? This was the first place that that system was developed. So we should say what he found. I mean, what, what was the, what, what emerged then in terms of the, uh, the archaeology there? Well, at, at various vertical levels in the cave, which of course correspond to different ages, mm -hmm. uh, there were a wide variety of, of different extinct species in, in the, the more upper levels. Uh, there were hyena, uh, saber-toothed cat, cave lion, uh, mammoth, wee rhinos, those kinds of animals. And then much deeper in, in the deposits, they had cave bears, which uh, were uh, actually a quite different species to the brown bears that occur much, much, much later. Uh, and then in addition, uh, there were uh, quite a large number of human artifacts, stone tools and so on. And then one of course very famous uh, you know, partial uh, tooth row. Well, I was going to ask Nick about that because part of the in the uh, the blurb for the for Kent's Cavern and the web page, of course, one of the things they're very proud of is the oldest what is it, the oldest bed of human, I guess, in Britain. Is that is that the way? That... Well, so so I'm led to believe. So this yeah. is a this is a little jawbone that's been uh, it was it was discovered in um, actually it was discovered a bit later. It was discovered in in the 1920s, and um, by a, a subsequent excavation. So Donald's talking about McHenry starting in the 1820s, Pengelly in the in the 18 in the victorian 1865 1880 and then subsequently there's been there's been excavations going on and and still today um so we have teams coming back but this little jawbone when it was originally discovered they knew it was quite important um it, it was a little bit of uh, upper jawbone maxilla yep. um and it had um th uh, teeth that were, and one of the one of the teeth in this jaw was loose so they got some glue and stuck it back in and to make sure they didn't lose the tooth and um, and it sat in a drawer down at Talking Museum, 
it's still at Talking Museum, which is the great thing about this jawbone. Um, but the, um, eventually, about 18, 1980s, they decided to do some radiocarbon dating on it. Um, at that time, radiocarbon dating went back to about 30, 32, 34,000 years. And, um, and they were getting dates from this, from that period. So it became sort of 32,000 years old based on radiocarbon dating. And then somebody thought, well, hang on a minute, maybe it's, maybe it's Neanderthal. Maybe it's not, mm -hmm. maybe it's not modern human, maybe it's, it's early, yeah. maybe it's Neanderthal. So they tried getting some DNA testing off it. And the DNA, um, the first DNA they got off it was, uh, was fish, fish DNA. And it was like, where did, where did that come from? And of course it was the glue <laughs> used back in the 18... Uh, but you wasn't a fisherman then, this person. <laughs> That's right, it was fish DNA, exactly. And then, um, and then more recently, it's been subjected to more more detailed analysis, and uh, uh, because because it was discovered back in the 1920s, actually the exact position, you know, where it was found in the stratigraphy of the of the finds has always been the challenging um, point. And mm. what was found above, what was found below, it relied on the deep, on the accuracy of the records that were kept in the 1920s, and um, and and and. The, but the, jaw, the jawbone continues to, to cause controversy over, over whether or how old it is. We know it's pretty old. It's definitely 30 odd thousand years old, but is it okay. 41,000? And that's the key. And that's really interesting because that puts it into the realms of being of somebody um, who, well, we know it's not Neanderthal. That, that, that was proved on the, in the DNA. Eventually they managed to find that it wasn't. Mm. But the, um, the actual, um, they found that they were um, um, you know, did they did these people actually live together? You need to explain. You said it, it, the forty-one thousand is the key one. Why? Why that age is key? So the so the so Neanderthals in 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 this country um, kind of went are known to have ex lived to about forty thousand years ago, and uh, so we think that. Um, um, and if this jawbone is 41,000 years old, and it could be older, then there is this overlap. There is this overlap um, with, the, uh, with Neanderthal. So potentially early modern humans cohabitated with Neanderthals here in, uh, here in, the, uh, in Kent's cavern. And that's, that's what intrigues people all the time. So do, uh, do you, you like the idea of the, the overlap? I mean, is that that's something that in terms of whether it's true or not, I mean, whether science demonstrates it, I imagine it's a fantastic thing to be evoking, really. It would be, wouldn't it really remarkable to, to imagine two completely different species living in the cave, you know, two completely different human species. And I think, I think we try and, we try and visualize what Neanderthals, how they made it might have been different to us, but I think it's incredibly difficult to, to understand fundamentally how these two species were so different. And the fact they potentially lived together um, is remarkable, and I, I don't. We're still that. That's still that cohabitation of two mm. species still to be discovered. And um, I also add, I also add that um, Pengeli's excavations in the deepest parts of the cave there uh, also yielded uh, human stone tools, no bones. But those those stone tools are very much older still. They're more than four hundred thousand years old. So no bones associated with those, although, you know, maybe Nick will find those bones tomorrow when he's cleaning up, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> so that's a good point then. I mean, is that how old, how old do we think it is in terms of human occupation? Is it, is it 400,000? I mean, potentially it can go back even beyond that because we don't have the, have the relics. Yeah, I mean, so, certainly those human tools date from somewhere probably around 450,000 years ago. And, and slumped into the cave. Um, so there were obviously humans, uh, at least in the vicinity of the entrances at that time. And then, uh, I, I, who knows do we know, do we know how they were living? I mean, in the sense of, were, were these, you know, how were these people, were they um, foraging and, and, uh, and hunting down by the, the shoreline and then coming, coming back up the hill? Do we know much about life at that time in, in any of those horizons? I think very little because only the tools, for, for the very oldest of points, only, only the tools were available. Uh, also, uh, during those distant <laughs> glacial times, the, the coast sea level was much lower, I guess. Further out, so it would have been a longer walk to pick up your seafood. Yeah. So, so actually, that probably means that some of the, some of the caves that are now submerged, there was probably Certainly. Something in there that's now, you know, Paleolithic stuff that's now completely gone with the sea level rise. Nick, sorry, you were wanting to come in. No, I was just saying that, you know, yeah, we talk about the two species, but, you know, this, this other species, Homo erectus, potentially, or Heidelbergensis, as they're called. Yeah. 
You know, that's, that's three species of humans using the same space. I mean, how remarkable is that? Yeah, yeah. You know, one site that's been, so over 500,000 years, people have been kind of, and, and they weren't, I don't, I don't think they were living here. I think they were losing the place nomadically. I think, I think when, yeah. you know, when, when the autumn came and the mammoths started heading south, then I think you'd probably follow the mammoth because it was time to, to head south. And, and then you'd come back here in the spring. But, you know, obviously you know, there was some kind of bush telegraph that was telling people about this amazing cave in Torquay, you know, which, you know, where, where you should go to because it's, you know, it sits on the, it's 50 meters above current sea level. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got a, it's, yeah. the entrance space is east, so it's protected from the prevailing southwesterly winds. Um, so it must have been, and, and it's big and it's huge, you know, to come and to come and to stay in. So, so, but it's it's a it's a remarkable kind of story of how why is it that people kept coming back here uh, to this one site, you know, and, and and using it for so many for five hundred thousand years. As um, as Nick said earlier, today people often visit the cave on and during you know, rainy weather and so on. Pretty much probably the same forty thousand years ago. I mean, it was. Equally good rain shelter forty thousand years ago as it is is today. So, in a sense, it's maybe, almost the same kind of, of of motivation. Maybe they came for the summer two weeks. Maybe they lived, you know, up in Yorkshire, and then for the holidays, they came down to the seaside in much the same way as people do today. I want to ask Tara about. Uh, I mean, we've we've talked a little bit about um, the kind of ancient life and ancient archaeology. Uh, but you know there still is an ecology in caves i mean there still is uh, things that are down there living there now not much and they tend to be very distinctive but do you get a sense of that when you go caving in terms of that ecology and life is that something you think about yeah definitely um i think in this area there's there's quite a lot of um ecology and we have some quite interesting caves particularly um near berry head where you can go into a very dry cave chamber and then right at the bottom is a seawater pool. Um, so you have really interesting um, ecological life there. You have, um, they don't sound very exciting, but um, they excite me. Um, you have um, a species of cave shrimp which live in Kent's Cavern as well. Um, and although we're talking about these really ancient humans, it's probably likely that these kind of species are actually the oldest inhabitants of these caves. But we don't give them much screen time. Um, you know, these are very small species. We have um, species of bats um, as well, living around lots of these areas, all of which are um, endangered and protected. So um, yes, it's, it's a kind of life that you don't really see when you're not in these unique environments. Thing. It's quite fascinating that, that idea of extremophiles. I you know the, all of the kind of life on other planets. It's often caves is one of the places they go to to try and get an idea of what life might be like if it's just kind of hanging on there by kind of a, by a thread. So, um, so I wanted to ask about the bat because you mentioned it in uh, Tara, but that is one of the ones the, the species that people think about in caves, and indeed the caves in the in this area are, are famous for. And and Donald, you, this is something you've been working on. Uh, uh, extensively. So can you tell us more about the, the, the bats and the caves? Right, so in, 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 um, in Devon in particular, the, 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 there are two species of horseshoe bats that are particularly rare uh, in, in, in Britain uh, that are uh, much more commonly found in, in, in caves of Devon, and so they're of particular interest. In fact, the studies on some of those horseshoe bats go back to the 1950s, some of the earliest uh, British bat ecological studies were, were beyond it in, in caves in, in Devon. Um, although, in, in a sense, bats are, are intermediate cave dwellers because they're they're boosting in the caves uh, you know, during the day, or, or in some cases hibernating and so on. But fundamentally, they're they're, they're leaving the cave to feed and so on. Um, so there's also a whole set of uh, typically invertebrates in British caves uh, that spend their entire lives in, in, in the cave. So a rather different sort of situation there. But but in terms of the uh, the richness, in terms of species diversity, and you know, the, in particular, as Tara mentioned, endangered species, I mean, what's the, what have we got in there? Well, I think probably the, the uh, Tara is probably more familiar with, with some of those locations than I am, but uh, probably the greater portion of bats are, are the, uh, the rarest uh, of, of the bats that occur in those, those caves. 
Tara, you obviously have got a soft spot from the way you were talking earlier on. I mean, I guess it's part and parcel of going to the cave is, is yeah, being with the bats. It is, and the, the most special thing is actually seeing a great horseshoe. I think I've been caving like nearly 10 years and I think I've seen two, maybe really? three underground. They're really quite rare. Um, I've seen lots of little lesser horseshoes and had lots of them fly over my head. And, and I think we have this really strange, and it's, it's almost like caves themselves. The public have this really strange perception and they tend to really stereotype these two things. They stereotype caves for being scary and dark and claustrophobic and they stereotype bats for getting in your hair I think and flying <laughs> over you and it's which is totally the opposite um and you know they are much more afraid of us than we are of them and you know we need to look after these species and conserve them um and you know they they are endangered for a reason and um that yeah so it's a really special experience to see one and I've had a hundred bats fly over me and none of which have got caught in my hair <laughs> um so yeah it's 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 really rare to see them and and point them out and i think that makes us quite lucky and i think one of the messages we need to start getting across mm. in terms of cave conservation is that actually these species won't be around much longer if we don't look after our climate and our our planet and their their actual habitat so what do you mean by that? Because you know, in one sense, cave conservation, not many people go into caves. So what is the, what is the risk? What is the danger? I think, um, well, I think if you look at the, the geopark in general and, and lots of caves in the area, um, we have quite a few lost caves due to quarrying. Um, mm -hmm. There was obviously such a big um, scene in kind of our history of quarrying in these sites um, and many caves were destroyed um and actually ancient sites are also under threat from you know the devastation of the natural environment so um you know it's kind of looking on that aspect obviously nick's coming from a very different conservation angle because his site gets a lot of visitors um so it's about conserving that but also you know allowing people to actually experience that environment um and although people don't go caving much it doesn't actually take that much human traffic to ha have an effect and i think if you look across the world in general it doesn't take much human traffic to have an effect on natural habitats unfortunately and it's something that i feel that you know we really need to to learn from and lots of the caves in our area have been concreted over because they didn't want school children to get near them and that kind of stuff so it's about having a dialogue about how we can protect these sites i think Donald, can I ask you about, about that in terms of their, their scientific, their intellectual archi you know, archives, the importance to preserve or conserve these, these spaces? Absolutely. I mean, in many cases, caves are the only repositories of scientific information on, on past ecology, zoology, climate, and so on, extending back you know, over, over hundreds of thousands of years, because surface environments are constantly subject to erosion, and so forth. Not just natural erosion, let alone you know, human modification and so on. So these caves represent little, little stores or, or, or archives of a wide variety of, of information about the natural world. Everything from um, uh, severe weather events, uh, volcanic events, mm. uh, changes in, in, in fauna and flora, uh, obviously the, the archaeological aspects of, as well. All of this potentially at any rate preserved in these caves, uh, but the, I mean, the records themselves are, are fairly delicate. The, you know, cave, the caves are not, a cave is, is a relatively small area compared to an entire hillside of, or, or gravel or, or whatever. So uh, things like stalagmites that preserve lots of information um, are vulnerable uh, yeah. to, to damage and loss. And certainly, you know, from a climate point of view, so many of the really high resolution climate records now are from caves, even down to seasonal changes in rainfall and the chemistry of the atmosphere and all the rest of it. So I, you know, I, I can see that losing the physical landscape of the cave is, is almost, maybe, maybe in some ways it's worse than some of the ecology that we're going to lose in there. And it was quite interesting that, um, you know, when, uh, when Pengeli finished his excavation in 1880, 
and uh, and and he was acutely aware that um, that that Kent's Cavern had been visited over you know hundreds of years, thousands mm. of years, just just coming in for an adventure, for an explore, and he was he was very aware that the cave needed to be kind of protected, and uh, and that's why he made my great great grandfather custodian of the cave uh, in his retirement, and then uh, and my great grandfather came along, and then they and they started turning it into what what is known as a show cave. So everything Tara has been talking about wild caving. You know, Kent's Cavern is, is the is the ultimate cave in terms of, you know, you're going into a cave without any equipment at all. You know, the guide leads you around. It's it's safe. There's there's paths. There's electrics in the cave. But but the great thing about this cave is that it's entirely protected because uh, yep. come come the evening we lock the doors and um, it's you know and, and but so there is no wild caving. There's no nobody can come in this cave without permission. And Don mentioned earlier on about you know excavating and looking in the caves. Of course, that's that's very strictly controlled. In fact. This cave and, and the caves in Brixham are, have got national protection. So Kent's Cavern has is, is got the same level of protection as, as Stonehenge uh, in mm -hmm. terms of if you want to do anything here, you need to apply to the, to the right bodies to, uh, to do that. So, so I think, um, so that, that's, my, that's our role is to, is, to, is to balance that kind of giving people access to the cave, but also allowing uh, the ecology to, to, to thrive and we have a really good conservation plan. In fact, Tara is responsible for a lot of that conservation plan, and uh, and that's and, and we follow that. And all our guides and all our all our training is about making sure that we do that. And I think that's what's nice about a show cave. And there aren't many caves in this country. You know, there aren't many show caves that you can go into natural caves. Yep. Um, but when you do go on, into one, they're all different. But you know, they are they're there to kind of educate and to and I think people leave thinking just differently about uh, yeah. about before the money went in. So it strikes me as really important that, and I was thinking about earlier when, when Don was talking about, and, and to some extent with Tara as well, is that almost like the, the key role of Kent's Cavern is to give people their cave fix, to, to get them to appreciate this amazing environment and what it means, so that they don't start, if you like, wandering around into other caves or feeling the need to, need to do that. That actually, it's such a fantastic educational resource, but it gives you that experiential uh, kind of feeling in a safe and, and kind of controlled and fun environment, actually. Yeah, and also I think with Kent Cavern in particular is it's it's so accessible. So you know you don't expect everyone to to be able to to go and do eight hours of caving or lots of rope work and that kind of stuff, or have the want to. Um, but I think what makes Kent Cavern so important is that people who may be slightly more vulnerable or may be unable to access the underground environment are actually able to do so. And I think that's really important because it's, it's part of our heritage and, you know, sharing this amazing human story. It's not just about going underground, it's going underground and actually appreciating our history, our, our human story and being in the environment where people live. So there's nothing I think more immersive than lighting a fire or seeing a flint hand axe in the place where, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, people actually were doing that. There's, you can't get any more closer to history than that. And I think, so as an educational tool, it's fantastic. I can see why you got your job, Tara. That's fantastic. And it's made me, kind okay, I want to ask the same kind of question to, to the other two. Don, Don, um, why caves for you? But what is it? What was so the last word that you would convey to people about the, the excitement of this world? Why are they important? I think because the, to me, caves are just a unique environment that relatively few people go into. And um, there, there's just such an, an enormous variety of uh, information and, and, and natural history and science that can be done in these caves, everything from geology pure geology, pure biology, all kinds of disciplines in between. Um, there's just no end of, of, of interest in, in these in structures. So Nick, if I can ask you, I mean, in terms of the English Riviera UNESCO Global Geopark, I mean, Kent's Cavern, the caves, it must be the kind of the, the crown jewels that it, in terms of the, the geological offer that we have here in that, this region. Well, it, it, it is. And uh, when, I, when I took over 20 years ago, I, I kind of it, it amazed me that Kent's Cavern was just simply another tourist attraction. It was just something to do on a wet day, you know, and and yet it had this remarkable story of lime, Devonian limestone that started its life south of the equator um, and travelled here. The, the way the caves are formed, 
and, and we needed to connect it to, to something special. And, and I think the fact that we've now got UNESCO global geopark status um, and Kent's Cavern and other sites are all part of that. But it, it really, it, it sort of lifts the English Riviera beyond just a, an English seaside resort to something of international value, of international significance. And I'm delighted that Kent's Cavern is absolutely part of that story. Uh, Donald, if, you know, there's there's a tremendous history of of excavation and uh, and knowledge, wisdom about this this cave. I mean, if, if people kind of experience it, they wander through the, the passageways and they, they might be really interested in finding a, a little bit more. I mean, where would you send people after they'd been into the cave in a rather maybe wet and windy Turkey day? Well, I think one of the unique things about Kent's Cavern and uh, is is that there is this. 150 year, more than 150 year record uh, of literature uh, yeah. on every aspect of paleontology, archaeology, geology, and so on. Um, and that's probably unique for any uh, show cave in, in Britain. And a lot of that, that literature uh, is quite readily available uh, these days uh, through uh, even the Kent's Cavern uh, website itself, other websites. Um, so there is this opportunity for almost anyone from um, small children on, on, on up to old people <laughs> like myself. Um, if, if you're interested in more detail, um, that literature is, is there for you. And that, that's a unique aspect of Kent's Cavern. Thanks. And Nick, final word to you. I'm sure, I'm sure you've got a spiel already that you, you give to people, but why are, why are caves you know, so precious? Or, or particularly these caves? Well, I mean, for me, it's a really unique story because I've got this remarkable family connection, which uh, which is just extraordinary, really, to think that you know five generations of my family have, have been responsible for this site. Um, and I, I I took over twenty years ago, and uh, at a time when my, my father um, died, and I and I took over the case, and and every day, every day in those twenty years, I learned something new about Kent's Cap. <laughs> And it's extraordinary, really, that it, it is, it's just, I mean, maybe that's something to do with the timescales involved. I mean, we are talking about 400 million years, aren't we, of geology. We're talking about yeah. half a million years of human occupation yeah. and, and through every period of history. So, so maybe, but there is something, every day there's something quite extraordinary about this place. And, the, and, and, it's, and it happens to be, you know, in a pretty nice part of the world as well. So, um, so you know, down in Devon, it's, and that's, you know, that just makes it quite exceptional, really. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you, everyone, for um, passing on this, this affliction you have to, to the rest of us, this affliction to go underneath the surface, go delving down into subterranea and, and uh, emerging with all these riches. So thank you very much for discussing it today. Donald, Tara and Nick, thank you. Thank you.